Okay, hello and welcome to your first uh, beginner's lesson for DG Melodeon. Um, so, I'll just give you a bit of a basic explanation of the instrument first. I don't know how much of this you might know already, but uh, we'll just briefly go over a few things you should know. So the reason it's called a DG Melodeon um, is because you've got two rows of buttons and they're in two different keys. The outside row is in D, so we call that the D row, the inside row is in G, so we call that the G row. Um, and what it means that uh, for a row to be in a particular key is that uh, laid out in a particular order you have all the notes of one scale, so that's the G scale on the G row and on the D row. The D scale. Um, and it's also the case, don't worry if you don't understand this for now, it's, uh, we'll get a lot more into this later, but uh, just n worth noting, uh, if you press all the notes on the D row, all the buttons, and play them on the push, that's a chord of D, and if you do the same on the G row, a chord of G. So that's kind of what gives the instrument its layout, but uh, we'll be getting all into all that in a lot more detail later. Um, so, um, I just want to talk a bit about how you're going to hold the instrument. Um, now, unlike classical violin or most other classical instruments, there isn't one set, correct, prescribed way of holding a melodeon. Uh, lots of good players hold the instrument in lots of different ways. Um, and there's, you know, there's plenty of ways that can work well. So I'm just going to outline a few of the most common ways of holding it. Um, and yeah, maybe some ways to avoid as well. So hopefully your instrument has a shoulder strap. Um, if it hasn't, I would recommend getting one put on. Uh, some of them do have a thumb strap and it's possible to play without the shoulder strap, just using the thumb strap to keep it steady, but um, it's a lot easier with a, with a shoulder strap. Um, and yeah, it's, it's what the vast majority of players do, so I'd recommend getting one fitted. Um, if you don't have one on at the minute, then you might need to get a, a bracket put on, uh, which might be something you're happy doing yourself. They just screw into the top and bottom, or anyone who uh, deals with sells, repairs, melodians should be able to do that for you. Um, so once you've got your shoulder strap on, you might have one, you might have two. Um, again, it's you know a matter of um, personal choice, really. You might want to try out a few ways of... Uh, holding this before you decide on what's best for you. Um, one fairly common way is just to have one shoulder strap, it goes over your right shoulder, and then you sit the treble end of the uh, melodeon on your left leg, uh, and then it's fairly steady there. Um, and then, um, you know, you bring your right hand to play. There's two main positions for the right hand. Um, a lot of players play with the thumb on the side of the keyboard, which is good, gives your hands plenty of freedom of movement, and that thumb should be just enough to keep the instrument still when you're moving the bellows. Um, the other main position that's mainly used by English players, um, especially players who play for Morris dancing, um, players who want to play uh, especially loud, I suppose, like powerfully, um, if you're playing outdoors for dancing, then they often have more of a firm grip on the keyboard, the thumb goes right behind, and then you've got the whole palm of your hand against the keyboard so that you can keep control of the instrument when you're making quite extreme bellows movements. Um, some people also just prefer that position because it feels like a more you know stable position for the hand, you're not sort of balancing on the thumb there. Um, but overall, I'd say internationally, certainly the thumb on the side is, is more of the standard hand position. That's how the ma vast majority of Irish players play, vast majority of uh, French players. Um, so I would give that a try, um, unless you find that a lot more comfortable, in which case it's fine, go ahead. Um, so that's, uh, that's one basic position. Now, you could have uh, a second strap on your other shoulder. Um, if so, you can still just sit the instrument on your leg, that's fine. Um, 
Although what a lot of people find is that if you have two straps on and you're sitting it on your leg, then the strap over your left shoulder won't really be doing much, it won't be taking much tension, and so often it just falls off your left shoulder and gets in the way a bit really. Um, other players have two straps and have it tighter, so if you tighten up the straps enough that the box then just sits against your chest, um, that's you know obviously good again in keeping one end completely still, free with the bellows. Um, it just puts your hand in a bit of a different position, so worth checking whether you find that more or less comfortable. Um, and I suppose the yeah two other possibilities I'll mention um, is so it, all these positions are kind of working on keeping the treble end, this end uh, of the instrument still. Um, and there's a couple of other ways you can do that by bracing against a leg. Um, so if I put my right, uh, so my right knee straight out in front of me, lower the left leg a bit, then you can then put the box against your right leg, and that again gives a really firm position. It means that if I take my thumb away completely, then I've got complete control over the bellows, so I'm not actually using the right hand to fight against the bellows at all. Uh, it's just keeping my hand position there to reach the notes. Uh, a lot of French players play like this, again against the right leg. Um, another position is outside the left leg, and this uh, seems to be the sort of prevailing um, approach for, for Irish players, and most of the young Irish players play this way now. Um, outside the left leg, um, so again, same principle. A um, couple of things to bear in mind if you are going to go for this position, you might want your strap a bit longer because you don't want to feel like you're sort of twisting your shoulder or your background in order to be able to have it this far out. Um, it also just means uh, you're going to have your left arm extended a bit more if you use the bellows at full stretch. Um, so you have to make sure your left hand's comfortable with that. So, those are all the options you might want to try. Um, if you want, you know, just giving one position to get started in, I'd say just sit it on your left leg again, that's uh, a good starting position. Um, so, that covers where the instrument is, where your right hand is. Let's just have a quick look at the left hand. Um, so there will be a strap on the base end of your instrument. Your hand goes through this. Now up here is the air button. Uh, your thumb should always be touching that air button and ready to use it. You'll need to use it when you're not playing just to open and close the bellows to start off with. Um, but eventually it becomes very important that we use that while we're playing. Um, so even when you're pressing other buttons, you want to be able to operate the air button. So that's part of your standard position. Now how far through you go with your hand, uh, there's, you know, again, different players are different on this. Um, it depends which fingers you're going to use on your left hand. Again, people vary. Um, I would recommend maybe starting off trying to use finger three and two for the lower bases. Um, some players do use all four fingers, some players only use one and two. Uh, three and two tends to work well for a lot of people. So just make sure that you can reach your lower inside uh, bases when you're reaching through but still with your thumb comfortably on the air button able to operate it and that should dictate how far through the strap your hand is um, and that should just sort of leave this part of your hand press the, the ball of your thumb like pressed against the instrument and that'll be your point of, of control where you're pushing to get the bellows to move in and out um, so that's, uh, that's got us off to a start with holding the instrument. Um, we'll start looking at some notes and play a very easy tune. Um, now, uh, obviously, uh, this is a recorded lesson, so I won't go around and round things as slowly as I would um, if, if you were here live. Um, so obviously feel free to stop, go back. And when I move on to new things, so I will get onto the left hand, for example, in this first lesson, Obviously, you don't have to move forward as quickly as the video moves forward. Just you know, wait till you've got the hang of one thing, 
stop and move on. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, this first tune um, is called Shepherd's Hay. It's a Morris dancing tune, very easy tune, first tune I always teach everybody. Um, and it only uses three buttons, so it's played on the G row. If you put your first finger on the third button of your row, uh, although some instruments it's the fourth, uh, they can start in different places on the scale. So just check that your, it'll probably be your third button, or maybe the fourth on the push, but the, the button that sounds like this when you push. Okay, almost certainly the third, but maybe the fourth button will give you that note. Um, so that's where your first finger goes, second finger on the next button, third finger on the next button. It's good uh, practice to get into, have one finger on each button, don't move around unnecessarily when you're playing. Uh, this just lets you keep your bearings and play from one position. Um, obviously we will have to move around later for more complicated tunes, but uh, you want to get into a default position of one finger for each button. Um, so I'll play you the tune first, uh, just as I normally would, so you can just have a listen, hear what it sounds like, and then we'll break it down and do it slowly. Here we go. <laughs> So that's Shepherd's Hay. Um, so to start the tune, you'll have your three fingers on your three buttons, your second finger, middle finger on the push. Um, oh, I'll just mention that. I'll be referring to fingers by numbers, um, and I'll be calling index finger one, middle finger two, ring finger three, little finger four. Um, some people who've played piano in their youth sometimes find this a bit confusing because uh, they might be used to finger one being the thumb. Um, hopefully that's not the case for you, so... Um, but anyway, I'll be calling them one, two, three, and four. So finger two on this note B. Um, if you're following along on the sheet music, by the way, just a quick explanation of how the sheet music works. Again, obviously we'll cover this comprehensively later on, but all you need to know for now is that when you're playing on this part of the G row, um, the the three buttons we've got here under our three fingers on the push are the notes on the three lines in the middle of the five. Um, so um, bottom line we won't be using, second line up is G, middle line is B, next line up is D. These are these three notes on the push, G, B and D. Um, and we're only using two notes on the pull, A and C, um, first and second finger, and they're the middle two spaces, so bottom space won't be used, um, second space is A, first finger on the pull, next space up is C, second finger on the pull. Um, we'll talk a bit about reading the rhythms in a bit, for now you can just... Uh, listen and hear how we're going to play them. Don't worry too much about the rhythm as well at first. The most important thing is just getting the, the right notes in the right order. Uh, don't hurry yourself through and make mistakes, you know, just take it really slowly. So, second finger on the push for B. Now the second note is C, which is on the same button on the pull. And when you get two notes like that, both on the same button uh, but on different directions, usually you're just going to leave your finger down. So that's what we'll do here. So you press the button, you push, and you pull. You don't need to play two separate presses of the button for now. Um, next note is D, third finger on the push. And then back to B, also on the push. Now the first sort of common mistake that most people make a lot when they're learning this uh, first tune is that they want to pull again when they get to the next note because it feels like you're push-pulling, push-pulling for every note. Um, but that third and fourth note are both on the push. And just as you were keeping your finger down between the B and the C, 
when you're pushing and then you've got two notes both on the push on different buttons keep pushing with the bellows so you don't need to push one push the other you just move the bellows steadily in and go from one button to the other try and make sure they don't overlap you don't want to hear you just want to hear two separate notes because even if you aren't pressing a button for a minute and you're still pushing on the bellows so I'm still pushing now, there's still pressure, they're just not going anywhere because there's no air being released um, okay so that's your group of four notes it's worth spending quite a bit of time on just that group even make sure you're really comfortable with them because that same group of notes comes around uh, over and over in this tune okay So just make sure you can do them one after the other at any any speed, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's your first group of four notes. Now you'll see in uh, the written music they are four notes and they're joined together along the top by a line. Um, so for the rhythm that means they are quavers um, or eighth notes. Um, so the, the bar is split into four, it says 4-4 four, four at the beginning, that's the, the time signature. Um, and uh, so each bar goes one, two, three, four, and the notes are spread over that in some way. Notes joined together along the top get half each. So you count them as one and two and... Um, so that group of four is just going to take us over our first two beats one and two and and then the next two notes are both black notes with no connecting bar they're called crotchets or quarter notes and you count one for each of those so one two uh, or three four in fact are at the end of the bar so three uh, now again, a, a point of technique to note here. Um, so we got to the B, that was the end of our group of four. Now I've got a C again, so we don't need to lift the finger, just pull. But now I've got another C. Lift the finger off the button and put it back on again. So whenever you get two repeated notes, exactly the same note, you just want to release the button. You don't need to lift the finger completely away like I did, that was just exaggerated to show you, but... Um, let the button come back up. You don't need to stop pulling with the left hand, you can just pull steadily all the way through and sound the two notes with the button. A lot of people uh, at first when they're reading it will do this, they'll pull, stop pulling and then pull again. That doesn't work very well, doesn't uh, lend itself to smooth playing, so... So, already quite a bit to think about in the first bar. B to C, leave the finger down. Up to D, keep pushing to the B. And then pull for C, lift the finger and play another C. Okay, the other bars won't take this long to go over because obviously we've just uh, covered quite a lot that's going to apply straight away to the next few bars. So, we'll carry on. The second bar starts exactly the same, same group of four notes. And this time it's got a first finger on the pull. Just as with the C, you play one, you lift off, put down to play the other, all one smooth pull on the bellows. So first two bars. Exactly the same group of four again. And a C, just like in the first bar, pull. And then you've got a B and a C. So there's a long run there of just the notes B and C going back and forth between them. So all that can be done without moving the fingers. Finger two's just holding its button down. And you sound the notes using the bellows. So there's the D. C, pull, B, push, C, pull. And the rhythm again, you'll notice uh, here we've got four in a group. One and two and one on its own. Three 
and then another pair for and. So one and two, um, one and two and three, four and. One and two and three, four and. Okay. Um, and then the last bar, we go up to the high D again, third finger on the push. First finger on the pull, A, and push for the G. Um, so as if you're reading this along on the music, um, it's kind of just a helpful little visual cue to notice that all the push notes are on the lines, all the pull notes are on the spaces. That isn't an absolute rule, so don't get it into your head that that applies everywhere. It just applies for parts of the scale and then it reverses around for other, other parts but it is helpful for little sections like this when you're getting started. Um, so I'll play that whole A part um, at a slow speed so that maybe you can join in with it after you've had a bit of a practice. So here we go. Uh, three, four. Okay, um, so get the hang of that. Um, when you have, we'll move on to the B part. So, um, yeah, most, um, the vast majority of folk tunes come in two parts, sometimes more, but usually two. Uh, and we call them the A part, the B part. Uh, usually they're both repeated as well. So the normal structure for a folk tune is A part, A part, B part, B part. So this tune, for example, what I've just shown you is one A part when you're playing the tune at full length, you'll play that twice and then play the B part twice, which I'm just about to show you. So the B part's actually a bit easier than the, the A part. It's got more long notes in it. Um, that's the first bar. So now we've got two black notes worth uh, one each, one, two, and then you've got a white note, which is twice the length. You count two on each of those. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, or there's one long note. And then the next bar is the same. Same rhythm, but a uh, different note at the end. Again, it goes down to A. And that's all there is that's different in the B part because the second, uh, the third and fourth bar are just the same as in the A part. Okay, um, so I'll play you a slow B part. You can practice along with that as well. So starting second finger on the push on the B. Okay. I'll give you the tune full length now at the same speed. Um, so when you've practiced up both of those parts, you can try playing along with this. Um, so we're gonna play that first part, A part, twice. There's repeat marks on the music, so at the end of the line, there's like a double line to finish with two dots. That means repeat uh, the section you've just played. Uh, so here we go, two A parts and two B parts. Three, four.
we go. Um, so as you're practicing, practicing that through, um, as I say, the um, the important thing really is don't worry about the rhythm right away. The first thing to worry about is the sequence of the notes. Make sure you can get the notes in the right order. So if you're if you suddenly think, oh, I'm not sure what the next note is, I'm, I'm, I might make a mistake, then just you know pause and then think, all right, what is it? It's yeah, it's third finger D on the push, and then you know allow yourself those pauses. Um, it's uh, it's really important when you're practicing. Uh, I think there's this misconception that practice makes perfect, and if you keep doing it, eventually it'll be right. It's actually it's not really true. Pract um, I've heard someone say it, it's not practice makes perfect. It's practice makes permanent. So however you practice it, that's how you you know you are going to end up playing it. Um, so if you can try to you know take your time and make as few mistakes as you can when you're practicing that's what's going to help you get it really solidly correct so that you can you know eventually just it'll just come naturally to play it correctly um whereas if you you know if you keep making the same mistake and then just moving on from it then that mistake becomes a habit um, and you'll end up doing it all the time so you know beware of pushing yourself too quickly and uh making repeated mistakes um, okay, so once that feels fairly comfortable, I mean, don't, um, like, I, I would normally go on to adding some left hand to this in a first lesson with a pupil, um, so, you know, make sure you can play that tune, but don't, you know, don't go away and play it for a whole week or anything and, uh, try and get it completely internalised or anything, it's, uh, this is where it's, you know, it's good to keep yourself moving forward, so as soon as you've got it just about comfortable, just about happy, you can get through it. Uh, then we can start taking a look at the left hand. Um, so on the left hand we're just going to use two buttons at first. Um, they're all in vertical pairs so you get a bass and a chord um, and those are you know there's four sets of those so bass, chord, bass, chord, bass, chord, bass, chord, uh, bass, chord, bass, chord and bass, chord, bass, chord. Don't worry about what they are too much for now. Um, we're just going to take this bottom outside pair. Uh, and as I said earlier, I'd recommend finger three and two for now. But if it's more comfortable for you, you can use four and three or one and two. Lots, you know, there's plenty of good players who use every method of, of fingering, so they're all fine. Uh, but definitely do use two fingers, one for each button, and get used to sticking to the same fingers. Uh, you don't want to you know, move one finger around in between them or anything like that. Uh, so have two fingers solidly on those buttons, and in each bar of this tune, you're going to play bass, chord, bass, chord. Um, and we'll just go through it slowly so that you can see where each left hand note lands on a right hand note in the tune. Get those linked together. Again, don't worry about trying to keep the rhythm steady. You know, you're not trying to push yourself through it at a, at a steady speed. You've just got to make sure everything meets up. Get the sequence of notes right. And I'll write this on the music so that you can see where they land as well. Underneath uh, each right hand note, uh, if I do a, a small letter B, that means the bass note, the bottom one. Small letter C means the chord, the top one. Okay, so the very first note, B on the push, gets the bass. And then you let go on the left hand, there's no left hand note for the second note. That pulls C, so. And then when you play the next note, D with the third finger on the push, you can play the chord. No note for the fourth note. So when you get a group of four like this, it's just going to be one on the first, one on the third. Okay, so get that group of four down first. Again, it's very important because that group of four is repeated over and over in this tune. So just make sure you're comfortable with that. For now, just keep the left hand uh, button presses quite short, quite tappy, so that you don't like lock down on the buttons because they're only being held for one note. So you don't need to, um, you know, if, if you get kind of stuck on the button, you end up getting them sending where you don't want them. So just light on these buttons. 
Now you get one of each on the C's. Okay. Um, keep checking for yourself on your left hand that you are hitting the right uh, buttons, because sometimes when I'm teaching people, um, I notice that they're, you know, sometimes they hit the same button twice, but they don't always notice themselves at first when they're not used to listening to it, so just uh, keep checking yourself on that. And then same group of four. And again, one on each. Um, group of four again. One bass note on the C, and one chord on the B on the push. And then in this last bar, you get one each for the first two notes. And then because this last note, white note, double length, uh, it gets one of each, the bass, then the chord. And you try to keep the same rhythm going in that, so if you're counting for the whole bar, one, two, three, four. A lot of people rush the last two because, you know, they think oh, it's a bass, then a chord, and they do and do it much quicker than the others, but it wants to be the same speed. Okay, so the whole first half with its left hand. Okay, and then the second half is quite straightforward. Again, it's uh, not as many notes. So one of each for the first two notes. And then bass and then chord on these longer notes. Same one of each again. And both on one note. And then just the same bar three and four as the A part. Okay, um, I'll play the whole tune at this slow speed with both hands so that you can play along with that. Here we go. Three, four. Okay, so that's the whole tune, both hands. Um, you know, give that as much uh, work as it needs. And again, don't worry about speed and don't even worry about rhythm at first. Just get the sequence of notes right and then try and build up the rhythm, get it to a steady speed. But don't worry how fast, just try and get it steady, you know, chugging along. Um, I'll just cover a last couple of things um, that uh, would be the first things to add to that to make it sound a bit more exciting. Um, first one is, so we, we're mainly just going to think about note lengths, um, because when you're playing a tune simply like this, no ornamentation, no fancy stuff, the real thing that makes, uh, that makes it sound good is how long you play each note and how loud you play each note, so it's all about an emphasis and uh, articulation. Um, so there's a couple of short notes we can put in. Often very good when you have repeated note like, notes like that to make the first note very short. So just as soon as you pull, 
lift off the button, so you just get a very short C. Um, the proper classical music word for that is staccato. Um, I'll be using that word quite a bit to talk about notes like that. And it's represented on the music uh, by a little dot um, over, the, over the note in question. Um, same in the next bar. Okay, so three notes to make staccato in the first part. And then you can just do the same one in the uh, last bar of the B part. Okay, so that's that's one thing just to, and you you know you'd be surprised by how much that livens up the right hand. Um, on the left hand, think about note lengths, uh, and you might have caught me already doing this accidentally a couple of times because it's what I'd normally do. Uh, for English tunes like this, it usually works well if you play the bass short, but then the chord you hold long, um, all the way up to the next bass note. So they're still coming at a steady, you know, one, two, one, two, but the bass is short, one, and then two, one, two, one, two. And that means that sometimes the chord will last over two notes on the right hand. So in the group of four, for instance, the bass goes on the first note, nothing on the second note, but then when you get to the third and fourth, hold the chord down and keep it down until you get to the next bass. And there it kind of happens automatically as well because we had that staccato note goes with a short bass and a long right hand note goes with a long chord. Same again. Long chord. Same again. Now here, this chord you'll hold down and then leave it down even though you change direction. So you get okay so when you use this long chord approach often you'll hear the chords change direction but it you know that's still good um, you can hear it happening in the B part as well on those uh, long notes short bass and let go and then a long chord I may have moved on the left hand there by accident, I'll get into that later. Um, that's the one. And same bar three and four is the A part. Okay, so once you put it all together with a couple of staccato notes and the left hand note lengths, you'll get something that sounds really good um, and will come out like this. So that's your first tune, Shepherd's Hay, using only three on the uh, left hand, on the right hand, two on the left hand. Um, we'll look at some more things you can do to that to uh, soup it up a bit later, but for now just uh, get the hang of that basic form. Uh, thanks very much.